Hello everyone, welcome to Unverified, the show that focuses entirely on small creators that are starting to make a name for themselves on social media. I'm your host, Dakota Broussard, and every week we'll be taking a deep dive into a creator's history, personal experiences with creating content, earning revenue, working with brands, and growing an audience. On this first episode, we talked to legendary podcast host and one of my former college instructors, Jonathan London. He's the host of the Geekscape podcast, which has been running since 2006. His show focuses on geek culture, and you can find him always interviewing the best guests on his show. When he isn't recording a podcast, he is a writer, director, and someone who runs around Comic-Con in his underwear. For context on that, you'll just have to listen to the episode. I have like a bunch of note cards, but I don't think any of this applies to you. Yeah, this is just a bunch of like questions about a uh, TikTok. <laughs> I've never used it. I'm like oh scared. My gosh. No, we, we could talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. If you just want to start us off by telling us your background, kind of where you got started in entertainment overall, your own personal content creation, Geekscape, everything like that. <laughs> it's kind of weird, like, because I... I don't necessarily know uh, sometimes if what I'm doing is any is is effective at all um, because of that whole thing of being like a jack of all trades, master of none. And so sometimes I I, I worry that in pursuing film, but also pursuing um, podcasting or having projects just in the entertainment world that go from writing to directing or animation to documentary to narrative uh fiction you know you you i worry that i'm not really concentrating on one thing um and then you add to it the idea that i run around in costumes and i do podcasts (laughs) and stuff like that and part of it is like teaching so uh, i do have that that worry that when i'm presented with the idea of like what i do or where that journey began uh or what that current state is it does throw me into a bit of a of an identity crisis Because a part of me is like, oh, yeah, like you ask yourself that question every day. And I think (laughs) that the simplest answer would just be to trace things way back to the beginning and knowing that uh, I've always been a fan of entertainment in some form or another. Usually it was comic books. Usually it was, uh, you know, ways to entertain myself. And that Mm -hmm. usually just meant television and comics. Um, But then it progressed into pursuing uh comedy and really wanting to be a broadcaster when i was in uh middle school and high school and knowing that my future was going to have some form of performance uh you know whether it be stand-up or hosting um it probably was not going to be acting (laughs) and and i knew that was going to be there uh but i really looked up to people who were broadcasters and were interviewers because I thought they had the coolest job ever. I thought they they got to meet cool people. They got to interview them. They got to find out what made them tick. And so a lot of my heroes were people who were funny and like David Letterman and Mm -hmm. early on Greg Kinnear, he was the host of talk soup, like the first iteration of talk soup when E was very much an early channel. Um, And it seemed like every one of their shows, anything could go like, they would just think of whatever crazy idea there was and throw it against the wall. And that would be entertainment or the early versions of, of comedy central. Mm -hmm. So that I, I kind of grew up on that stuff, especially in middle school, watching things like kids in the hall and mystery science, 33,000 stuff. That's all sort of having comebacks now um, that people my age are in charge and they're bringing back their childhoods. Right. Uh, that that was always kind of part of it. So I went to undergrad uh, for broadcasting. I went to under, undergrad for communications. I have a communications degree as my undergrad degree, and it and I did radio more so than I did my classes when I was an undergrad. And mm-hmm. when there was a spare minute, I was in the radio station. And by sophomore year, I was running the student radio station at Penn, and uh, I just would spend nights in the radio station with my friend Kevin listening to music and thinking of funny scenarios or sending out emails or getting on the phone with different people, knowing that bands or artists or creative types were coming through Philadelphia or lived in Philadelphia and trying to get them on the radio for interviews. I really started building a lot of what I'm doing with Geekscape now, then from the characters to, uh, to interviewing people regularly, 
Um, and it was always funny. It was, it was because nobody else like wanted to be on my show. You know, like <laughs> I, I did not have a lot of friends. I was, you know, going to school for radio does not make you cool. Uh, I don't even know if being in radio makes you cool, but that's what I wanted to do just because I knew that that's how David Letterman got to do the, the, the tonight show or the late show. Right. Was, he got to, he got there through radio and then he got there through, stand up and being a newscaster. So I just, I went to college with that blueprint in mind, but I'm serious. I got my freshman year an 8 a.m. on Sunday slot. That was what the seniors gave me. And nobody wanted to get interviewed at 8 a.m. on a Sunday on the radio. Like, right. It was stupid. So I started making up characters and I would I would be like, hey, look who's in the studio. And then I would do a character and like would shuffle some chairs, make it sound like they sat down and maybe they'd get like pro wrestling intro music and stuff. And, you know, would play like a CD or something to get them into the studio. And, <laughs> and, we'd, and those things started turning from interviews into storylines. And um, it, around the time that it was the end of my sophomore year, a public radio station in Philly called WXPN wanted us to start doing Sunday nights. And, immediately our listenership went from just around the campus mm-hmm. to Harrisburg to like Northern Delaware to half of New Jersey and the entirety of the Philadelphia tri-state area. And that was when it got a little bit insane when people would call up wanting to talk to your characters because I didn't change a thing when I went to midnight, when Kevin and I started going doing midnights in Philadelphia, we didn't really change anything. Like we, brought blink 182 into the studio and interviewed them dressed like mexican wrestlers and like <laughs> we just, i mean we were we were just having a lot of fun and the characters kind of lent themselves to making short films uh because after a while people were just calling and saying hey i love your stories i can envision them and kevin my buddy kevin mccaffrey who was my best friend in college he was a a, a rock nerd like me we just loved music and and uh, would just hang out at the radio station all weekend and all week, really. Uh-huh. He, he would take like foreign language classes, but he he would avoid the papers for these foreign language classes because he was he wasn't the most focused while he was at, at Penn, which which is insane because he then went on to like join the special forces and become like an elite soldier yes. <laughs> and like. <laughs> The dude basically became like Rambo and his focus is acute and the dude is like <laughs> really awesome and he's such a good dude and we're still close friends and uh but while he was at Penn he just wanted to goof off with me and I was kind of the bad influence so um <laughs> he was not going to do these foreign language papers for like German and J- Japanese and all that stuff and he would just take all these different language classes and then <laughs> he would tell the teacher instead of writing the paper, can I make a short film in that language? And I was the only person he knew who had like a, like a high eight camera, like it still to tape. Mm-hmm. And so he would convince his teachers that instead of doing a paper, he would make a short film in German or in, in Japanese or whatever he was studying. And, uh, so he would recruit me to run the camera, be in front of the camera. And we would run around campus just making almost pretty much experimental short films uh, with, you know, languages that I would just have to like pronounce phonetically. Like I, 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 if, if Kevin wasn't a good student, I, I wasn't even in the class. Like yeah. I'm, I'm trying to like phonetically repeat stuff in Japanese and in German. And, and he would show these, these shorts to his classes and they'd go nuts because they were insane. They were like, you know, cut to somebody with like, like falling off a roof and a dummy splatters and like this head explodes. And these were like schlock experimental, stupid movies. And, and so we just started making short films and that's what led me to want to go to film school. But it wasn't really something that I wanted to do until I was probably a, a sophomore or junior, it was really a junior at school. Right. And, uh, and that's pretty late in the game. When, when you think about people wanting to become filmmakers, you know, you hear a lot of stories about them playing with their GI Joes and making short films you know, in their parents' backyards. And, and I just didn't do that. Right. So that was it. I went to film school. And when I uh, went through the other, I went through Columbia in New York. And after two years, I, I moved out to LA and I mailed back my thesis work and kind of did commercials and music videos out here for a stretch. 
Um, but I also, uh, I always miss broadcasting. I always missed having a microphone and, and having guests. So that's really where Geekscape came from was wanting to right. get into it. And by that time it was 2005, 2006, you started hearing about podcasting and I got on the ground pretty early. It was 15 years ago and it, it was, it's still kind of the wild, wild west, but it was yeah. completely open back then. And, we, and so that was kind of cool, you know, just discovering something before pretty much everyone else. Yeah. Well, and I mean, there was like a time where obviously I growing up, I wasn't really into podcasts a whole lot. I got super into podcasts, like probably around the end of high school and then all throughout college until now I listen to a lot of podcasts. But it's like there was a time where I feel like everyone thought podcasting was, you know, dying off and being replaced by video podcasting, like revision three, that sort of thing. And then onto YouTube. But it's like, I feel like even in the last few years, like podcasting has really had this explosive growth. Maybe it's just my perspective from an outsider, but I, I agree with you. I mean, my first show was on Revision Three, uh-huh. and and I remember, um, you know, doing a year on Revision Three, and at the time it was a video show, and right. but at the same time, YouTube wasn't really a thing yet, not for mm-hmm. another year, and where people were primarily watching these things were on their. Uh, on their iPad, uh, uh, their iPods, they are a video right. iPod. So it was like the third generation iPod had a video element to it. And so people were downloading these and watching them on their video iPod. And I hung with video for a, a while mm-hmm. until I realized that people just weren't really watching them except on YouTube. But right. the YouTube like limits on length were really what kept me off of YouTube for a long time. Right. And it, it, it wasn't like radio. I I hung with a, a video show for a very long time, like I, I would say seven, eight years into Geekscape until I realized that people, were, they weren't really watching it anymore. And it wasn't really the kind of show that I would just put up on YouTube and feel proud about. Um, so I started doing audio only and the numbers did really well. And it wasn't until this pandemic hit that I said, hey, let's bring back some video component to it. Because right. other than like the 400th episode that I did live, did I do anything that was video that I thought I'd be proud of? I don't like doing a podcast where you're watching two people around a table, like talking to a like that. It just felt unnecessary for me to show people talking to microphones at a table. And right. being like, I know, I know that people are just putting these things up on YouTube and they're going and they're playing games or they're doing other things while they're in the background. But for me, the appeal of video was always to do a, a late night show. So if you watch episode 400 of Geekscape, I have a desk, I have a co-host, we have a, a live band. It was really done with multi-camera the way that I would want to do the show. And if not for this pandemic, Katie, who's my co-host now, we would have done a monthly stage show. And I brought Katie on as my co-host this year, mainly because she's fearless and she's the funniest person I know, but also because she has this work ethic, which is how we met, that she was, she's always been part of different improv groups where once a month they are doing a live show somewhere in Los Angeles on stage. And she's done that for years. And I was like, that's what I want to do with Geekscape, but I want to have the desk in the co-host in the band. And I want to do it once a month. And, um, and so I brought Katie on to just be like, teach me how to do this live element, uh, that would also have broadcast, uh, you know, portions where, where people could watch it at home and Mm -hmm. streaming or something. But when the pandemic happened, I just kind of was like, all right, uh, let's figure out how to do something streaming for a bit. And then once the pandemic lifts and we all start going back to live theater and stuff, you know, uh, maybe we'll find a coffee shop or something with a stage <laughs> and we'll do some live Geekscapes with an audience. Because the one thing I've loved about having a live element to Geekscape now with an audience is the comments and the like active back and forth with the audience. It's just been a lot of fun. And, uh, uh, and that's, again, something I didn't have when I was just taking a microphone and recording somewhere with somebody. Right. And so it's it's all been an evolution, which goes back to like your original question of like what has kind of been the um, the process and like the the journey. And I think that if, if you're not constantly changing and evolving, then your journey is over. 
you know, and and I don't think it's ever been more apparent than now in uh, this quarantine and this pandemic where you and I as storytellers have to continue to figure out how to tell our stories. And if we cannot evolve and keep telling our stories, then we are, then we're dead. And, and, uh, and so it's, it's been challenging, but it's also been invigorating and right. And who are we, if not people who, who take on a challenge, you know what I mean? Yeah. It'll always be something. But it's just like, yeah, I mean, (laughs) for me, this pandemic was kind of weird where it's like, you know, it's been this awful thing and it's been really bad for so many people. But at the same time, in a weird way, it's also lended itself to causing so many great things to happen for people, you know? (laughs) Yeah, you get a pretty mixed feeling with that. And and it can really trigger your imposter syndrome or your guilt reflex where you're like, wait, should I be making a living like this while I'm doing this? Because people <laughs> yeah. are struggling and the people who are struggling are the people who are really keeping our bottom up. They're the people who are providing our food. They're providing our health. They're providing our transportation. These are people who can't take time off. And uh, and you watch them struggle and you watch them shut down and you watch other facets of society and people get hit. And you're like, well, I'm going to go make some voices online and hope you people <laughs> like it. Uh, yeah, but he, he just have to keep trusting that if the audience isn't there, then then they wouldn't be. You know what I mean? Like you, you just got to you got to roll with it. And, and ultimately, you just got to keep singing your song, because right. when you stop doing that, even if it's for one person, two people, even if it's for yourself for long stretches. And there have been over 15 years, there have been years where I look at the Geekscape numbers and they like bottom out to very low. And I'm like, dude, I'm I'm doing the show for the most hard core of Geekscape at this moment. And it's almost like a flame that, that has gone down to the embers and just having to learn how to get that flame back, whether it's technology shifting or like you said, an explosion of podcasts. So uh, suddenly your competition has skyrocketed and people can't find you. You know what I mean? Like it was right. easy to be found early, but now it's a needle in a haystack. And without a <laughs> big corporate behind, corporation behind you or coming off of a reality show or being Conan O'Brien, like it's really hard to like swim to the surface and you got to hang on to those embers. It was It's the embers that have, have made you survive. The people who are, who are there day in and day out and are like, Every week they're going to watch their Geekscape, and um, and that's who I really do the show for. And it's pretty awesome to see that in the pandemic, as people have gravitated towards this medium, that 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 the fires back, and more we have more and more of an audience. It's insane. I hope they like live shows. Maybe that'll be a giant mistake. <laughs> <laughs> I, hope, I, hope. I don't know. I th- I think you would knowing you being one of your classes. I think I was only in one of your classes at CCH. You were, you were in one or two, and I don't even consider that you were in there because <laughs> I caught you at a place where like, your, your senioritis was so out of control that I was like, you know, and, and it's kind of my approach to teaching. Like my approach to teaching really is I'm not a strict teacher. I'm a very easy teacher. And right. really my approach is I'm going to keep myself, I'm going to make myself an open book. I'm going to dump a ton of knowledge that I have useful or not on these students. I'm going to try and hit all the points required of me by my position in the, the, the job. And if the students are listening, the students will get it. And, and if they're not, this isn't the time in their life to get it. And I, and, yeah. with, and with you specifically, I just, I was like, Dakota has so much senioritis right now. And he's <laughs> out of here that all I can do is be like, Hey man, I'm going to say a bunch of stuff. If you don't hear it, that's all good. When you graduate, it ain't over. You know what I mean? Cause yeah, no, definitely. <laughs> because I think that you and I have had more interactions post your, your time as my student than we've had when you were my student, you know what I mean? And I have teachers like that, that I just wasn't in the frame of mind in my life or in their and I's relationship where I wanted to listen to them or was right. able to listen to them. And I look back and I'm like, well, I'm glad I'm friends with them now. Or I look back and I'm like, damn, I would have loved to retake that class because that was somebody I really respect 
now probably yeah. didn't respect them too much then. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I look back at some of my films. And I was like, oh, damn, they, they made that pe- that film that I really love. And I could not have been a worse student. <laughs> Dude. I love you just coming on and calling me out on my own show like that. <laughs> It was, I mean, uh, like I notice it in students that are seniors and, or even like, you know, in their junior year and I had it. I mean, I spent my senior year at Penn filming a movie that a 90 minute movie, I mean, a 90 minute film, my senior year at Penn called Spores, the movie about, uh, about these, this, this, it's like Night of the Comet, this eighties movie that I love. It's a horror movie where like Haley's Comet, everybody was obsessed with Haley's Comet in the, uh, in the 80s because it was like the big thing that you wouldn't see for another millennia, whatever it was, you know. And so they made these, they, there were a lot of movies where like the comet's going to come past the earth. One of them, it was Stephen King's movie, Maxima Overdrive, where like the comet comes by the earth and suddenly machines and electronics are, like start attacking us. Uh, but another one was Night of the Comet where, the comet sprinkles like space dust on everybody <laughs> and uh-huh. it, it turned into zombies. And, uh, and the movie is not great, but these two right. girls are like grounded. These two teenage girls are grounded during the night of the comet. And so they, they come out of being grounded and everybody's turned into zombies, but like them. <laughs> and, and so I loved that movie and this was 2001 and I loved that movie. And, I loved like Kevin Smith movies and all that stuff. And, and so I made a movie where my friend Kevin and I, an extension of the radio station, we, uh, we were just losers. We weren't even grounded. We were just losers. And a comet goes past the earth and turns everybody into zombies. And we have to kind of like save everybody. And like, we have to like kill like the spore queen, which is somebody who like, was like the main infection, like nexus point, you know, like in every zombie movie, if you take that thing out, like everybody else, really vampire movies. Like if you kill the head vampire, everybody else gets cured. Uh (laughs) So we did that. And we, we spent every minute that we could like blowing off school, blowing off friendships, blowing off every responsibility under the sun to make spores of the movie. And we ended up with a, like a 70, like it was an, it's like almost a 90 minute movie. We're running around with laser guns and like making jackass references, and like it, it's a comedy. And um, hmm. and we showed it once at school, and we're like, and people went crazy. People thought it was awesome, and of course, like our friends and different people were in. You know, like we never talked to the football players, but we need a big guy, so suddenly we were talking to the football right. players to be in our movie, and we showed it once, and people went crazy. So we ended up showing it again. And so we showed it a second time. And then the, 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 the student TV station was like, we want your film and we're going to show it forever. And I think they still show Spores. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's like almost 20 years later. And I think Spores of the movie is still being played. Uh, and it's fucking crazy. <laughs> there's, just, there's just some college students in the year 2020 just getting high and seeing that on there. And it's, perfect, it's a perfect movie for that. And, and then like, I remember just like being butthurt a few years later when I got to LA and like Shaun of the dead came out and it's these two losers fighting zombies. Right. And, I was, and I was like, I made that four years ago. And then, but like <laughs> Shaun of the dead is so much better. And then Simon Pegg came on Geekscape and I was like, do I give him a copy of, of like spores the movie? But really please, like, please tell me you did. No, we had, him. Uh, I, I, we had, I asked Simon to be in our documentary, Doc of the Dead. I, I think I could have like one imposition on Simon and I used it to have him in our documentary, <laughs> and, and which is insane because the dude is like super gracious and nice and right. uh, and would have absolutely watched Spores and loved Spores, but Spores was, <laughs> let's be real, Spores was a piece of shit. <laughs> but, I mean, half the charm was that like your friends were in the movie and the other half of the charm right. was that like, it's bad. <laughs> 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 I haven't thought of that in a while. <laughs> I have it on a hard drive. Uh, I got it digitized because it was something that we shot on mini DV, and I have all the mini DVs. I've got like all that stuff, but I obviously don't have any of the edit stuff or Final Cut files or any of that because it was right. two thousand freaking one. But I have a digital copy of Spores on a hard drive, and it is so buried deep in the folder branching tree that I'm like, if you want it, 
you're gonna have to work for it but it's, <laughs> it's like something i never want released to the world but uh, it's there it has to see the light of day it, i've shown it once since i've lived in la i've shown it once we had a geekscape we used to have geekscape picnics every year uh and i would and i wanted to start doing geekscape picnics again but covid um and after the geekscape picnics what we would do is we'd do a thing called a gauntlet and what a gauntlet is is after the picnic after you're like all hopped up on like soda or liquor or whatever you you know you're eating a bunch of trash and you've hung out in like a park all day um you go and do a a, a like a sleepover and the what the gauntlet is is you take the worst movies and i've got a trunk of VHS films that are like, <laughs> and, and, and there you got to go with these VHS movies like uh, that are like straight from the eighties or nineties. And like one of them's a fantasy movie. One of them's a military movie. One of them's a ninja movie. One of them's a sci-fi, you know, one of them is kind of a, a sex movie. And so you got to have like these really bad movies, right? Exploitation trash. And a gauntlet is where you watch them in a row and you watch like, five of these bastards in a row overnight with the junk food and your friends. And if you fall apart, it, like if you fall asleep, there's like markers out and there's like, <laughs> there's like decorations. <laughs> like, like you're sitting through this movie and it's a piece of shit. <laughs> and, and you're like, man, I don't want to be here right now. But if you leave, if you leave, like you're like, you get made fun of. If you fall asleep, you might wake up looking like a damn werewolf with glitter on your face. Like, so like like the whole point of the gauntlet is you just gotta like get through it you know and so you never know what the movie is going into the gauntlet and one time we had a gauntlet and i put spores in and uh was like this is the only chance you'll ever gonna see get to see spores so spores was part of a gauntlet one year and uh and it has not been seen by human eyes since. And that, <laughs> I literally think that was 2006 or 2007. That <laughs> this thing has just been buried for like most of my life. <laughs> I mean, those are the kind of movies that I wanted to make. And the, I definitely still have a, a part of me. I mean, my thesis from Columbia was a film called Gay by Dawn. It was a horror movie for rednecks. <laughs> I made a movie and Columbia was not having it. (laughs) They literally said during my approval meeting for my thesis, this is not the kind of movies that we make here. Um, And basically what Gay by Dawn is, and and that is released, that is up on my Vimeo Uh on Geekscape TV's YouTube channel. And basically what, what Gay by Dawn is like these four rednecks sitting around a fire telling ghost stories. And one of them goes, I'll tell you a story. (laughs) <laughs> a couple years ago this boy left the freeway you know and is still stuck out here in these woods and it's like okay what's so scary about that he's like he's gay and then immediately they're like oh shit we're in the woods right and so and so they start like pointing guns at each other being like how do you know that story what you know it's like it's real. it was really like political in a way that where you have this movie where these fear mongers and these bigots and ignorant people are kind of letting their fear like cause them to point guns at each other uh-huh. pretty much how we you know it's america and and I, and I made this movie in 2004 God. uh 2005 and i really made it about the whole bush cheney like like right. thing and it, i don't i think gay white on is as it, like i think it speaks as, as well today more so than it did in okay. 2004 but Sounds like it does, yeah. I made this movie, and like Columbia had to play it because it was, it was my film for the Frem Festival, <laughs> and 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 it was like your, <laughs> it was like your graduation, it was like your non thesis or your thesis, right? Like they had to play it, right? And so they put it last, Dakota. Like my <laughs> my dad and I had already been living out in LA, <laughs> the movie in Austin. My dad and I go to New York to watch my film. And we're looking at like the program and they put gay white on last. And, and I knew what it was. I knew it was like, they buried it. And I'm like, Oh my God, they buried gay white on. I cannot believe this. It was the biggest mistake they could have made because you've sat through film festivals for student, like student film festivals. They're pretty painful. They're pretty bad. (laughs) And the movies are too long. And the subject matter is too like, serious and it's this and it's that and there's cello music and the acting is not great and 
and I mean, it's hard. Like that is yeah. a gauntlet oh, yeah. is sitting through a film festival. And then after like just making people for a couple hours sit through all this stuff, this weird ass little movie comes on. <laughs> <laughs> Where these, where you know, it's got exploitation music, like down, 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 down. <laughs> it's got like the John Carpenter wannabe music. It's got the, the we shot it on sixteen millimeter, made it look all like rough and torn up. <laughs> right. It looked, like, I mean, and it has like a disclaimer at the beginning that the movie was found in an abandoned cursed drive-in, and now <laughs> like, you're the first people seeing it. You know, it, it was a schlock. It was supposed to look like a schlock movie, which right. was kind of an out. I mean, those are the movies I liked, and it's called Gay by Dawn. It was named after. Evil Dead 2, Dead by Dawn. Mm-hmm. And man, when this thing hit the screen, I've never seen anybody respond to a movie like that. Like, they were waiting for it. They were waiting for any excuse to laugh or <laughs> scream or whatever. And when they start seeing these, like, hillbilly dudes being like, how do I know you ain't gay? You know, and they're pointing the gun <laughs> at each other. And it's like the scene in The Thing where they, like, don't know who The Thing is. And they're like, they don't trust each other. And, uh... And I mean, I, they were laughing from the very from the very effing beginning to the end, and I was like, "You're missing so many jokes and all this stuff." And then, and then the damn thing went on to play like eighty film festivals. It played Jeez. festivals for the next two years, and got optioned twice, and uh, and we never made a feature. And uh, and it's something that like my producer is like i don't want to hear about gay by dawn <laughs> i was like no dude i still i still want to make i still want to make a feature gay by dawn i still want to make a movie where you have like these these dudes out in the movie out in the woods and like their bigotry and their fear causes them to like take each other apart i think it's a morality story i think it's funny and i think it's funny as hell i just think it's funny yeah you well know, have these that- mag- have these like maga dudes like shoot <laughs> That would do so well in 2020. That's what I'm saying. But, uh, you know, people are really like, people are sensitive. People are, you know, like, I don't know about that. You know, everybody's very PC. Everybody's very cognizant of cancel culture. And I'll tell you, the only people who were ever upset with this movie when we played it. And and we played it before Shaun of the Dead at, at an outdoor, when, when I, was part of zombie con, which is geekscape produced these zombie conventions Uh in 2010, 2011 in Seattle. And in the year before that, we did an outdoor cinema in 2009, the summer of 2009, we did an outdoor cinema in in silver Lake. And so it's pretty early. I mean, early in the day for outdoor cinema, like 2009, Mm. we were doing outdoor cinema and, um, and Xbox, Microsoft were, were our sponsors. And my friend Ryan from Seattle, who was part of the outdoor flea market and everything up there, like, the Fremont outdoor cinema. And he ran that with his dad for years. And so he brought it to LA and we did it one summer and we, we played gay by dawn before Shaun of the dead, which I thought was appropriate. And people walked like, like I had this one couple walk out and be like, this was offensive. (laughs) And the people who get offended by gay by dawn are never gay. They're always hyper sensitive, hyper contextual, like straight white, people and they're like this is i'm looking out for them <laughs> and uh <laughs> like, all right see you later um but i think there's a cathartic quality for anybody who's been you know live their life and they end up like with you know being on the receiving end of bigotry or that kind of you know hate to see the people blow their brains out. <laughs> which is so fucking simplistic and awful for me to say. <laughs> but I think if you're like bullied by a certain demographic or you're an outsider and you're you just had a rough go of it, to finally see like your oppressors or you know, these right. people who finally see them point guns at each other and blow themselves away, like okay, I'll I'll drink to that. <laughs> Pretty much anything that's against straight white people in the year 2020 is like, it's okay. <laughs> it's been like that for decades. Like that is why I made this short. Cause I was like, I need to make fun of something. I was, right. I was, I, I saw a kinmanship with you when, as a student where I just wanted to get out of there. Like <laughs> I th- I was above film school. I was done with it. I knew what I had to do. I I knew I, I knew how to do it. I had it all figured out. I didn't, but right. but I couldn't wait to get out of there. And so, I mean, I just remember how bad the stuff was that I made while I was there. 
And uh, and within a year of coming out to LA, I was I was making music videos because I knew a lot of bands from the radio, and and so that was fun, and that that led to doing some commercials, and and Geekscape helped uh, get some narrative stuff going, um, and Gay by Don helped, and Gay by yeah. Don really was the whole hey, you want me to make an Oscar caliber Ivy League film school movie? No, I'm gonna make this. And you're going to have to show it. And they showed it last. And and it, I think it worked out well for all parties involved because because Gay White On is still like one of my favorites. And um, and I, I will still bug the hell out of my producer and be like, hey, man, one day you're going to look up and you're not going to be able to reach me for three months. And I'm just going to come out. <laughs> I'm going to come out of the woods and be like, made a movie. And, just and crawling out of the woods with the tape in your hand. I'm going to have the whole freaking hard. I'm going to have all the hard drives or maybe we'll shoot on a Bullock's camera again and have a bunch of 16 millimeter. And, <laughs> and I'm going to come out and be like, hey, I uh, hope you don't mind. I uh, I cast an all star cast of <laughs> dudes. I mean, I have the cast in my head. I have a dream. My dream cast would just be like all these amazing actors who you like. I would be like, oh, hey, Robert England, do you want to be in my horror movie? Hey, all, you know, all these people you've seen in horror movies. Right. You know, Kane Hodder, who played Jason. Obviously, Robert England played Freddy. Like, all these dudes. And you just call them and be like, hey, you're usually playing the bad guy. What if you play the bad guy in this movie, but you realize halfway through the movie, you being, like, the bad guy from, like, Deliverance or, like, Hills Have Eyes, you're actually the victim by the end of it and it's like a you know it's a i think it's a fun idea i want to make it i want to make gay butt on you got me fired up <laughs> screw every other movie i had a, i had a movie shut down by the pandemic where we were already casting actors and stuff and we're just now trying to get that movie back up and mm-hmm. we're working with an agency and managers to get actors reattached so we can raise money um but i literally cast an actor the week before the pandemic and i think it's a beautiful film it's a movie i want to make it's it's a drama with some comedy in it. Um, people uh, who've, who've read it and enjoy it compare it to like a little bit of an Alexander Payne style. Um, I would love to make that movie. Uh, if uh, if I had the chance to make that movie or Gay by Dawn, holy shit, that'd be a tough call. <laughs> <laughs> you either have a movie that I think would be like an indie darling that people are be like, wow, this guy truly is a filmmaker. Or... I could make this piece of schlock <laughs> where where maybe it won't win a single award or make any money, but in okay. 20 years, you know you'll be at a convention and a bunch of dudes will show up with a fucking like Sepultura shirts and metalheads and they'll be like, dude, gay went on fucking rules. <laughs> <laughs> Don't quite know which career I actually want. <laughs> you could have this critically lauded film or you have oh, something dude. people cosplay as. <laughs> I straight up want both and um, and I don't see why I can't have it. And maybe that's goes back to what I said originally. Like at what point are you dividing yourself to a level of ineffectiveness where right. you get neither, you know? And, and, and that keeps me up at night sometimes where, where, um, where I just say, you know, ultimately you got to put, I, ultimately when I wake up and I, and I have not kept myself up at night, I tell myself, um, Jonathan, you you gotta you gotta chase the money sometimes, and sometimes you gotta chase what's got the heat. And we ha- we had heat on this project, and um, and maybe if the project gets made and people give it what I think it hopefully will earn, uh, hopefully I can step up and it'll earn those things. Um, then hopefully I can completely use that good karma to destroy my career with something like Gay White On. <laughs> go out with the a bang yeah. here are the prophecy like i i still want to make here the prophecy which is the fantasy series with my brother the pro wrestling fantasy series <laughs> <laughs> it's so weird <laughs> i love all of them you know <laughs> i love all of them um we have a cartoon we're working on that's based on super action man the character of me in the God. in the underwear i um, just can't you any, can. any any time you pop up on my Facebook feed with that, it's like, what the hell is it's going crazy. on? <laughs> so that, so bad. So that character came out of me at Comic Con, just trying to get any attention for Geekscape. It's in, uh-huh. and for myself because 
because Comic Con is a blood sport, and oh, yeah. in in when you you're there with like an independent brand like Geekscape, and it's a podcast, but it you know you're trying to explain it to people, and really you just want people to pay attention. Comic Con, they're not going to give you attention. They want Robert Downey Jr.'s autograph. Like right. they care about two things. They care about Batman. They care about Spider Man. They care about you know whatever the the, the next big uh, studio thing is. They care they care about Hall H, and so. Knowing that and seeing that it was go- I was going to have to just fight for everything, I started going around interviewing people in this mankini like speedo <laughs> with an American flag on it. Originally, it was spider. It was a Spider Man mankini. It was uh-huh. like instead of an American flag, it was Spider Man's face. And my producer George, his like mom found it in Thailand or something weird, and <laughs> she's like, Jonathan would like this. He likes Spider Man, and I was like, "This is a pair of underwear, Spider like Spider Man, these like Spidey Manties." <laughs> and so I was like, "Well, I can't wear these as myself," so I put on a wig and the Rambo wig and the, the shades and everything, and we took a camera and I would walk around count like Comic Con interviewing people as super as Super Action Man. And being like pro eighties, pro action, pro John Claude Van Damme, Dolph okay. Lundgren, it's all the stuff I love. And so it comes real quickly to me as I'm improvising because when I put that super action man outfit on, uh, every Comic Con, I go to the booth, I, I bring Super Action Man with me mm-hmm. in, in a bag, and people are like, "You're gonna do Super Action Man?" I was like, "I don't know. Let me call him. I haven't heard from him." And then I go to the bathroom. And, and I just have to tell myself, like, you're going to do this. You're going to do this. And I put on the outfit knowing that everyone outside of the bathroom is completely in, in their underwear anyway, because it's comic con. Right. Um, from the second I open that door as Sam, I'm just running on adrenaline. I'm just like, <laughs> scared. I'm just waiting for like security or somebody to be like, get the heck out of here. Um, they never have. No one's looked twice at me. Um, and I've like bumped into kids and shit, like where I'm not paying attention and I'm talking on the camera and I like, I, my groin goes right into a kid's face because I'm walking. Like, I've, it's been, I've had people bite me, dude. Like, Jesus. I'm literally only wearing my underwear and shoes. And I would go around like interviewing people on camera and it's just a total spectacle. And where can you find more of it? Geekscape, and so that char- <laughs> that character just became like the popular thing, and and that people loved it. And there have been other characters with Geekscape, and I love all the characters, but Sam is the one that people loved. And um, and so I remember ten years ago, plus being back in Austin uh, for a holiday, and my dad being like, "How much longer are you going to keep doing this stuff? Like, how much longer?" <laughs> keep running around in your underwear and at the time my brother was on wwe so my dad has like two sons on like running around in their underwear you know <laughs> what i mean like, like paul was a wrestler for Vince McMahon for almost like 10 years and mm-hmm. and people were like hey i saw your son on tv or my kids love your son or this and that and and now my dad's got two kids running around in their underwear and i just remember <laughs> didn't it didn't compute with me dakota like maybe like latch that on to like my lack of like intelligence i don't know but when my dad said how long are you going to keep doing that kind of thing i it it i I heard it but i didn't understand it because to me it was just an extension of like the characters i was doing on the radio right it it was an extension of gay by dawn it was an extension of like all those things that i thought we're just the way that I communicate with the world. I was like, I don't know. It's like, you're, you're asking me to change languages suddenly. Um, and I didn't understand. I, I didn't get it and because there's always been parts of me that when I'm down and I'm defeated and it happens all the time that I look up and say, yeah, but they're doing it. Why not me? You know, yeah. Will Carroll gets to run around in his underwear and I make <laughs> characters. Why not me? You know, uh, you know, Jimmy Fallon gets to interview people on late night. Why not me? All these things. Why not me? And I think that ultimately you, you then have to ask the question, well, why did, why haven't I leaned more into stand up? Why haven't I been like, I'm going to fight like hell to become an SNL writer or, you know, I'm going to fight like hell to 
do as many stand-ups as I can or fight like hell to really make Geekscape, like take it to Earwolf or take it to one of these big right. comedy podcasts and things. And I think that's where the other thing kicks in where, where it's like the DIY ethic that I have coming out of the punk rock scene saying, well, shit, man, you're going to build this for yourself and you're going to own it. And so with super action, man, now like working on it with some people and looking at the option, it's like the, I'll tell you the hold up on the option agreement is like the ownership thing. It's like, mm-hmm. Hey, this is something that you could easily just like sign the contract they gave you and you make some money and then Sam goes away. But, um, but it's important for me to like still be a part of that character. Cause to me, right. it really is my view of America. <laughs> I have an incredibly, simplistic view of the United States. <laughs> and then like, it's, it's simpl- I mean, it's idiotic, but I'm like, yep. Uh, freedom and rights and all that stuff. Yep. I agree with you. We clearly live in a gray area. We live, we clearly live in a place where, you know, they say there's two sides. They say there's division. I think that we're not as divided as we think. We just don't know how to communicate anymore. So here's an, here's a character that exemplifies everything. And he's really stupid and you can all agree with him. All right. <laughs> He is like the most pure id of um, of America. And in doing so, the character is a total fuck up. He is the dumbest person on the show. <laughs> it's a lot of fun to write, but it's also a lot of fun to do the character. So who knows? Yeah. Like if I don't, you know, don't listen to your parents. That's all I got to say. <laughs> You've been, you know, doing Geekscape in particular for about 15 years now how do you stay motivated and stick with it especially when you're saying that you know there's been times where the viewership has bottomed out and you're kind of just speaking directly to this like core audience but how do you stay motivated through all that and how have you stuck with this for as long as you have it you got to keep it interesting which is Mm -hmm. which which is a challenge in and of itself um and life is hard in, in life is hard for those battles that you never like know other people are fighting, you know, like the, like a really hard one was four years ago. I got divorced and I, you know, and my, the geekscape saw me start dating. They saw mm-hmm. me get engaged. They saw me get married. They saw me get divorced. And then they saw me start picking shit up again. They saw me like move to a crappy, you know, move out of a house and into a crappy apartment. In Los Feliz. They, <laughs> they saw me like, Literally, like, I don't want to die, Dakota, but I definitely was like, I'm going to lay on the ground here until I wither away and rats eat me. <laughs> like, that was <laughs> like, that definitely happened within the last four years. That was definitely a thought that crossed my mind. And like my friends that I know in real life, by that point, the Geekscapists had been a part of me for 10 years. So right. um, it's like, you got to make your bed every day. If you, I'm, there's a, a, a like a life, philosophy that i subscribe to called essentialism and basically just tear everything down to the essential things that you got to do and for me you got to get up you got to eat three meals a day you got to stay kind of some semblance of fit and you got to make your bed and if you do those things then then you're you're done you're done that's all you got to do and so i think making the bed the morning is like a really important thing because your days can go to absolute shit and if your day goes to absolute shit and you've made your bed, at least at the end of the day, you get to get into a made bed. And right. that is a much better feeling than like getting into the bed representation of your life, <laughs> which, you know what I mean? Like, like, like you feel good about something. And when life gets really hard, you, you have to like have something that you still feel good at uh, about, even if it's getting into a made bed, and uh, and for a long time, all I had was a made bed and people who wanted to listen to me talk about the fucking MCU. And it, the MCU has never really mattered to me. And none of that stuff has really mattered to me. But the people have mattered to me. And the people who have asked how I'm doing or the people who wanted another episode or who've mm. been there day in and day out and or every week and giving you feedback devil those have always been there and and you know and this is we're not talking ancient history here we're talking like in the last four years yeah and there were definitely times when i was a teacher at at cch with you even if you weren't in that class there were times when 
dude, I was falling asleep standing up because of my lack of sleep. Yeah. I got called into the head of the school's office and he said, Jonathan, we lost a student because they saw you falling asleep standing up. Like a student who was like a, coming into school, first quarter, first class, I'm standing up lecturing and I was so like physically riddled by the depression and everything I was going through that I was falling asleep standing up talking <laughs> Talk, that's how natural talking is for me i can sleep while doing it um, and, uh, and, and 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 uh and that that was so hard for me and i just kept telling myself like dude you've you've done this before you've yeah. you've you know, i lost an older brother my brother my brother paul and i lost our brother daniel when we were i was i was about to be a senior in high school mm-hmm. and i you know my brother was coming over to return a no effect cd and he never got there and a couple hours later, I get a phone call that he had been hit by a drunk driver. And that really was like a level of decimation yeah. that I still feel the, the results of. And so when I tell you, like, you know, maybe that's the answer to the question. Why didn't Jonathan ever, like, gun it to be a writer on SNL? Why didn't he ever do seven nights a week at the comedy store in the improv to try and get, you know, become a, a stand up mm-hmm. uh that because because i spent a couple years doing stand-up regularly and and i was getting very good at it and uh and and i just you know the you know there was definitely always that voice in my head that was like hey this okay this is all gonna this can all go away this can all go away and so there's definitely a dark part of me that that says that, that 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 ties me down and and really like being unhappy and realizing that you are unhappy and, and I'm now I'm actually talking about my marriage, like I'm in this situation and, and I think that fear has kept me out of a lot of great opportunities. Mm-hmm. I, I know. And, and so like going through trauma, like I did back as a teenager, uh, you know, I wasn't cognizant of the fact that there was, fear as a controlling factor i you know and uh and and, it, and i didn't have to i could go straight to college and the next four years of my life are planned out right i've said yeah. there's freshman year sophomore year there's you can be an autopilot like as a student you can totally be on autopilot and then there was grad school and that's all i had to do and then when grad school started ending i really started like internally freaking out and being like well <laughs> like can someone please tell me what to do next? Because God forbid I'm on my own two feet. And I'm not talking about like financially, although it definitely affected my finances. I'm not right. talking professionally, except it absolutely affected my profession. I'm not talking about, uh, you know, romantically or socially, although it affected everything. It affected my health. It affected everything. And it was that fear that, hey, everything's going to fall apart again, dude. Everything's going to fall apart again. And I think I needed therapy. I think I needed a lot of stuff. And so I built Geekscape and I built characters and I built stories and I believed in them. And what I didn't realize was I was building my confidence Mm -hmm. and I was building a place I could go to that was a made bed. When your day went to shit internally or externally, you had a made bed waiting for you. And it literally is a made bed. I think it should be a made bed for anybody who's struggling and doesn't think they have anything going for them. It's okay to have years where all it is is a made bed. It's okay. You don't have to hit home run. People don't always hit home runs. Do you know how fucking rare a home run is? Do you know how rare (laughs) being... Look at the batting average of the most successful baseball players of all time. You would never bet on them hitting the ball. Right. Because chances are they're going to miss. And that's what life is. It's not made up of home runs. It's not even made up of hits. It's made up of swings. Right. And I had to learn to start swinging again. And I had to get the confidence back to be swinging. And when I started doing that, and I think running had a lot to do with it, and writing had a lot to do with it. And having a private space for myself had a lot to do with it. And Geekscape was part of that. Um, I think once I built up my confidence, I looked up and I wasn't exactly in the life that I wanted. 
And if there's anything Daniel's accident taught me, it was that I only get one of these things. And I blew my life up. (laughs) (laughs) Dude, I, I blew it up within a month. I think I blew it up within two weeks. And immediately we started making music videos and I went to Brazil and made a film Mm. and I came back and I'm just going crazy and I'm still going crazy, but like that fear isn't going to win. Like you have to lean into the fear of missing and know that even if you miss failure is the greatest feedback you're ever going to get. And you're just going to get, keep getting better and you can't like, hold on to that you have to just take what you can from it and move on and just think you're going to hit the next one what you can say about every single one of those hall of fame baseball players is that they thought they were going to hit the next one and that's what you got to think you're not going to probably hit the next one you're probably going to miss the next one but you have to think you're going to hit the next one and and it i learned that one really in a lot of hard ways and um and I think you witnessed some of it, you know what I mean? And, yeah. and ultimately it led to a place where I said, you know what? The most important thing isn't like really being the strictest teacher. <laughs> it's, it's like the, the most important thing is building a kind of a connection here. And I have y'all for 11 weeks uh, in, in the quarter system at school. And beyond that, let's just see what I can light. You yeah. know what I mean? Like y'all are those embers. And if you don't feel like getting lit at the time, and I really didn't think you did, I think that you were like, fuck, man, you were thinking about your finances and you were thinking about how much <laughs> you're going to owe You were verbal about these things. And yeah. Oh, yeah. And like, Dude, just stay, just, just like keep that glow. And, and you know what? Part of that is that anger that you carried. Part of that is that frustration that you carried because yeah. you, because you know, Dakota, that you're capable of more. You know, right now, that you deserve and you are capable of more, but life doesn't give it to you. You got to go out and grab it. But even then, when, how, where do I even begin? Well, it's so incremental and so small. And you have so many days of what the fuck. I'm just going to lay here until the rats eat me. (laughs) You don't even know that those are part of that journey. Yeah. And even when I was laying there, not wanting to ever get up again, I was on that journey and it, and it was like, and I eventually got up, you know what I mean? So yeah, make your fucking bed every morning. It sounds, insane. <laughs> it sounds insane, but after a month of making your bed, you aren't ever going to want to not make it again. Cause yeah. it's just, it's crazy. I teach on zoom now. And, and if a student doesn't have his bed made in the background, are you making I'm, people make their bed? I intend <laughs> to make their bed. Dude, I have... It, 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 when, when family members walk through the frame, I have them arm wrestle them. Like, I'm, dude, I got, <laughs> I've had students arm wrestle their family members during class. Like, <laughs> I have to keep it interesting for me too, man. Like, come on, I'm held hostage too. <laughs> uh, I'm honestly, yeah, if you thought I wasn't like the greatest student in classes, I am... So lucky I got out of there before coronavirus because I could not imagine me. Oh, you had had arm wrestling in Zoom classes. Um, I enjoy some of it, and and uh, as much as I love the energy of being with people, and I I really do feed off of people, and I love that in teaching. Uh-huh. Um, there's a part of me with Zoom that in teaching remotely, there's a level of efficiency to it that I'm like, you know what, you could have been doing anything up until two minutes before that. You didn't have to waste time in a car, right? And technologically i i don't have to like f with the overhead i got it right there on the share screen and i'm happy to go i know exactly how to do everything technologically and i try not to waste students time if yeah if we're through the material and you guys are happy let's go work on our stuff and um and uh yeah i don't know i think i think i've tried to keep, have a level of respect for the students and where they are because i i just remember so acutely where they are and yeah. and and it's It's important. I mean, we're always students in some sense, right? I do like teaching. You kind of talking about your whole motivation and how you've kind of made your way through the suck, to put it simply. But You just got to lean into it. You just literally have to lean into it. The only way is through. That's it. You can't get around or else you just get weak. 
I think I've told you this, but like the saying that I love this saying is like my, my saying anytime I wanted to be a little bitch, (laughs) easy decisions lead to a hard life, hard Mm. decisions lead to an easy life because I mean, you, it speaks for itself, but you know, every time you've shied away from one of those hard decisions, it's eventually caught up with you, whether it was a lie, whether it was avoiding a tough conversation, any of that, it's always caught up with you. You only put it off to another day or you make things worse. But if you just man up, lean into the fear, lean into the uncertainty, lean into the insecurity, and you make that hard decision, it's gone. It's behind you. It's yesterday's problem. And your life gets easier. When you start racking those up, your life gets easier. And um, I've transformed my life in a few years. And it's insane how rapidly like things start happening for you when you don't let fear control you. And I have nothing but empathy for people who are controlled by fear. And I know it's le- it, it leads to abuse. It leads to addiction. It leads to a number of things. Yeah. But you slowly have to start making your bed and building it back and building it back and, and like, oh man, sometimes you can't even detect how strong you're getting. <laughs> and you look up and you're like, holy shit, I came all this way. <laughs> I didn't want to move. I wanted to get eaten by rats and I actually made it to the doorway. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes I was like, damn, I got up. I went to the grocery store. All right. That's the win for today. Time to, <laughs> time to pack it in. <laughs> I didn't watch TV for seven hours. All right. That's a win. <laughs> Add it down to six. Okay, great. <laughs> Learn to forgive yourself. All right, here we go. Yeah, I think, you know, just focusing on what I want to do and just pushing myself. That's really something I'm focusing on right now. I'm young, <laughs> but it's for as long as I can remember, I have had this feeling where it's like, well, you know, this isn't going anywhere. You know, I've made YouTube videos on and off since I was really young, since I got on YouTube really early. In college, I was making, you know, I made over a hundred YouTube videos, but then 2018, it just died. And I have uploaded like three times since 2018. And it's like making YouTube videos and doing social media is something I'm super passionate about, but I kind of just stopped and I got dismotivated and stopped focusing on it. And then especially when coronavirus kicked off, I just started applying to jobs. I've applied to hundreds of jobs since March and I'm starting more, sorry, it's just hard. It's hard. You yeah. find yourself in a really hard window and, that, and you have to ask yourself how you're going to evolve. And it's, and sometimes it's through blunt force. Sometimes it's just through continuing what you're doing and seeing how you can expand when the opportunity uh, like appears. Yeah. Dude, you don't have to make YouTube videos if you don't feel it. Like ultimately it has to be conducive to who you are. It has to be something that like with Geekscape, I, it's very easy for me to, as this podcast is evident, uh, evidence of, uh, to talk nonstop. So, <laughs> so throwing on a microphone and talking nonstop is pretty easy for me. Um, and sometimes you just have to, uh, uh, think of like what that YouTube video in 2018, you're, a, you were a different person yeah. and who are you today? And what is that 300 YouTubes or 100 YouTubes in a year that is today? Is it the TikTok? Is it writing is it singing a damn song is it running is it exercise like allow yourself to change and allow yourself to evolve and um forgive yourself for like grieving and allow and, and forgive yourself for saying goodbye to who you were even a month ago yeah And it's like, I kind of think that I've started to realize over the last year is that what I like to do is talk about creating, (laughs) which is kind of funny because it's like there's being a creator, but then there's me over here. I don't want to talk about the process of creating. So it's kind of like I'm now focusing on trying to figure out what exactly that is. And, you know, part of that is this podcast is just talking to people who create stuff predominantly for social media and other things like that. That's all Geekscape is. Uh And years that's all i had so it goes back to that meme of the little girl why not both like (laughs) this is not 
you know, like you can still talk to people. We're talking for like an hour plus. Yeah. Oh yeah. That leaves you a whole lot of time the rest of your week to make your living, to take care of what you got to take care of and maybe start scratching out a little bit of your own creative work. And if this podcast in talking to creators is what keeps those embers lit, like I'm saying is what keeps you like swinging at bat just for a while. Maybe next year is the year that something pops for you. Maybe right. next year is the year that something else lights up and you're like, Oh, I have a film. Oh, I've got a new channel. Oh, I've got a new thing I want to make. And this doesn't have to go away. It, it's just what's keeping the embers lit right now. And mm-hmm. it, it's firing you up. Like completely allow that. It the, You can do both at the same time. Take it from this guy. We talked about la- Return of the Jedi last night and how Luke is a dick at the beginning of that movie. <laughs> God. Why use the bone to like, or why fight the rain core with the bone when R2 has a lightsaber like 10 feet above your head? Right. Uh, just stop being a Chad. Um, or it's <laughs> like, sorry, I recently watched Star Wars from episode one all the way to the end. Yeah. With my girlfriend, you know, even Rogue One solo. But it's just like in the new trilogy, Luke yeah. Luke turns into such a bitch. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, at the end of the day, uh, it's really important to still have that singular vision of a filmmaker. Because <laughs> <laughs> it felt like the, there was a lot of cooks in that kitchen on the, on the sequel trilogy. Yeah. Yeah. And even if the prequels aren't that great. Uh, they still oh, had no. that singular voice that was George's, and yeah. maybe you know, maybe by that point it wasn't one that you agreed with, but it was his, <laughs> and you got to take it. And um, I uh, and I really what I, all I'm saying to you is like that this podcast is what keeps those those embers warm and lit. Like you're down, like that's cool. Yeah. You might have to hang in the dugout for a little bit. Coronavirus might have all forced us into the dugout to just sit for a bit. But yeah. we're going to have our at-bats again. We just have to survive. And that's it. That's it. Right. And you, you'll get out of this, dude. Again, like you said, you're young. I'm still considered young-ish. <laughs> <laughs> and so... Uh, you're, you're a boomer in my eye. Just kidding. I'm, <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm going for this shit. <laughs> <laughs> Let's make gay by dawn. <laughs> Let's make it. Let's make it. <laughs> movie let's piss some people off it's got i mean i'm i think i'm wired like you are like sometimes i just want to piss people off (laughs) it's fun yeah uh i kind of wanted to switch gears a little bit because there was i didn't expect us to go for this long but there was some questions i did want to get to but something i like to focus on is audience building and i know you we've talked a couple times about you saying that geekscape has bottomed out but i was just wondering like at this current time like the statistics wise like your average viewer base if that's something that you track i was just curious what that number is i i track it and i track it heavily um and the reason i I track it is to make sure that I know what's, what's working, what's not working. And I think that you have to stay on your analytics quite a bit. You know know who your audience is first off. And, uh, and the geeks gave us for vocal when they, you know, which is what I love, what I love about the live streaming aspect of the show. Mm -hmm. It's something that I think we're going to start. We're on Twitch. I'm awful at it. I don't really know anything about it. And I'm awful at YouTube. I'm pretty good at Facebook which is insane. Mm-hmm. Like you said, I'm a boomer. So Facebook's right. yeah, not- yeah. You're a boomer. So, so, uh, <laughs> because of my, like, be- I just have, you know, YouTube is something that changes so frequently that yeah. I, that it's like really hard to get good at it at this point. And Twitch is something that a lot of my friends have gotten really good at and they've invited themselves to help me like get into it. But because of the way that I do the show and it simulcasts between three or four platforms at the same time. Mm-hmm. I can't monitor our Twitch while we're recording. I'm doing my show. So it takes a little bit more of a studio and volunteer perspective there to have right. somebody monitoring your Twitch stream and working with things like the chat room. I can do some chat room stuff, but I can't do things like multicam switches or any of the promotional aspects of it or throwing things up. Um, you really need somebody to help monitor your live streams with you in Twitch. So I'm trying to figure out how to get around that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I do love the Twitch community and I love the interactivity between those. So uh, again, long story long, like (laughs) 
it, it is all part of the analytics and I have to know like what, what to feed, like what, like if, if you're paying a lot of attention to an audience that doesn't care, you got to shift your attention to someone else. And mm -hmm. in Twitch is something that I'm going to give a little bit of a t more attention to probably towards the end of the year and into 2021. Um, because I think that it could have a lot of fun reward for me. And, right. and at the end of the day, like tracking analytics and going from like 10,000 listeners down to where you have a couple thousand listeners and mm -hmm. watching stuff like that and it really can be damaging to your soul um because you're like oh man how am i ever gonna get this back and speaking straight from like the revision three days like having kevin smith as an early guest built the audience uh -huh. you know having, being on a, a show being on a network with kevin rose you know in in people watching dignation and then watching you like totally built the audience then going on your own, because again, that DIY ethic of like, I want to own this. Um, that was something where I was like, okay, let's go for it. And I kept some of that audience and just had to build it all back. And sometimes people grow up and they don't want to listen to your show anymore because that mm -hmm. was what they did in high school. Uh, and then some people grow up with you because you're growing as well. So um I'm I'm really into monitoring analytics a lot. I'm really mm -hmm. looking at that stuff because, um, you know, you got to feed the stuff that rewards you. Right. At that point, though, you got to think about what those rewards are, because for Geekscape, they've never been financial. Uh -huh. they've, I've always taken any of the money that I have. I'm looking at T-shirts right now that I have to ship tomorrow, and so any of the T-shirt money and stuff like that. That stuff that pays for the Comic Con booth at San Diego, which is our probably our biggest annual investment, mm -hmm. those are that that pay for stuff like our hosting, as we've grown our traffic. That stuff that's paid for things like every now and then I'll buy the Facebook and Instagram ads because I think they're really aggressive and cheap, and yeah. they do a really good job of hyper marketing, um, or hyper targeting. So um, you just have to think about what those rewards are. Knowing that Geekscape's not a a financial reward for me i have to start looking at what, what other model is it okay is it an audience aggregate reward okay great so that what i'm doing is i'm building an audience to aggregate them that i can point them towards something that may be otherwise financial right so last so this past weekend we we uh we premiered a, a short film that we would have premiered in real life but we premiered it online <laughs> at a film festival uh that we used the geekscape audience to crowdfund could I have crowdfunded that movie without them? I don't think so. Geekscape was a big part of crowdfunding that that short. Right. Um, so that in itself is a bit of a financial and professional reward for Geekscape. So you got to just ask yourself, like, what are the rewards? Are they emotional? Are they economic? Are they uh, connections? There's absolutely 100%. I will never be able to financially quantify it. Been a reward to doing Geekscape and just meeting people. Holy shit. Having Simon Pegg on your show and then putting him in your film, I will never be able to financially equate that. Right. Ha you know, having different people in your on your show and then being able to work with them creatively, I never would have made those connections in a million years. I couldn't get myself arrested as a director when I started Geekscape. Like like it never would have happened. You know, but get, but having somebody on on the show and then saying, "Hey, could you check out the script?" or "Hey, we should grab coffee," or "Hey, we should stay in touch." And then ultimately building relationships with those people and having them collaborate with you as actors or co-writers or producers. My producer came out of Geekscape. He doesn't mm -hmm. want me to make that on, but I'll be talking to him tomorrow about that <laughs> shit. <laughs> I, I, mean, I met him at Comic-Con because he was like, what is this Geekscape thing? It's loud. Why are you running around in your underwear? <laughs> um, there are rewards to it. So as you go crazy about the analytics, as you look at the numbers and you say, damn, they're going up, they're going down. You just have to think to what end? Like just take it one question further and say, okay, to what end? How is a hundred more people going to change the, my rewards? How is another thousand, 10,000 people going to change my rewards? Will they get me the rewards that I really want? Really ultimately, what are those rewards? And then reverse engineer it and say, all right, if my reward is to be like, crowdfunding a film, then I do need 
not only numbers, but I, but I need not empty numbers, right? Because you can have yeah. empty numbers. I need numbers of people who think of me as a friend. So that actually starts shaping the content of your show. And also the content of what I also invest a lot of time in after the show, communicating with these people, talking to them, bringing them into the right. fold, and then feel like they're a part of the family, not just part of the audience. Uh, and I've had disagreements with co-hosts and collaborators all the time about that stuff where they, where they would talk to people who listen to the show, who've told you the most intimate things about their lives. And they'd be like, oh, that person's a friend of the show. And I'm like, no, motherfucker, that person is just a friend. Yeah. Like they have, they're not, they're just like, don't think of them as how they relate to you and your show. Yeah. <laughs> like that's callous. This is someone who's <laughs> like, you've seen through major life things. You know, we've had we've had audience members battle cancer. We've had audience members suffer loss. We've had audience members graduate high school. I've written I've written recommendation letters to like colleges for audience <laughs> members. Mainly the ones who have like started writing for my show, or maybe they moved on and they want to go to grad school. Like I've done so much and it's so been so much fun, but I've been but that is a reward. So the numbers is just the beginning for answering whatever question you really need to answer. Right. What is that question you really need to answer? And like, so just play it forward. Do you want to crowdfund? Okay. You need to puff the numbers up, but make sure the numbers aren't bullshit. So you probably can't just puff them up with Facebook ads and, and Instagram ads and fake numbers. So like it probably won't help to be pumping them into a Facebook page because a Facebook page doesn't have the same algorithm that a Facebook group does. And a Facebook group is a little more of a tight knit structure. So, right you really need to be more active on Twitter in promoting this stuff because people might start learning you as a personality, you know, super action man doesn't work on Twitter. Super action man works are fucking great on Instagram. So then you start thinking about where do these different things land? So you really have to, to get a little bit more beyond just the blind numbers. And when, when geeks hate dips and I look at the numbers going down, I don't panic. Mm -hmm. um, I just course correct. And that's it. I love bringing on Katie. I brought Katie on in March or April as my co-host because, again, she's she was supposed to be part of the live show, um, and she's awesome. and uh, And she's helped the numbers. She's brought in some of her friends to start listening. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and yeah, uh, um, you just have to find different ways to augment it and just keep changing, just keep chasing it. Did that answer your question? <laughs> A little bit. <laughs> so, at this point in time, then, what does the Geekscape audience look like? They look a little closer to you than they look to me. They're a little younger than me. They're very much male. I mean, that is something that it's another reason to bring Katie in uh, was that the Geekscape audience very much, I mean, to the degree of like 94%, I believe, is a male audience. They right. are in their 20s and their 30s. Very few of them in their 40s. Very few of them are in their, te in their teens. So when I look at like an intensely American British, Canadian, and sometimes Australian Geekscape audience mm -hmm. they look a lot like you and I, and they're kind of between you and I in age. Um, they're super fucking smart. Like they're all college educated, which is great. And, I, and when I looked at the, at the analytics, I'm really proud of that um, because I can just have a, a straight speak with them. I don't have to, you know, these are kids who are like you. They verse themselves on the internet. They research stuff. They yeah. look stuff up. You know, they're literate and um, they're hungry. So, we can, I don't have to dumb things down for them. They're not too young for me to, to get away with stuff and, and or to, to spell things out. And they're not too old to the point where like, I super action, man, would turn them the fuck off. You know what I mean? like, <laughs> um, and at the end of the day, like the content I make, isn't the smartest content. Like it's dumb. Right. I try it dumb and <laughs> I approach Geekscape sometimes with the same approach that I do when I have writer's block. It's something I don't believe in because you can always dumb things down and I'm really good at dumbing things down and I have fun doing it. And, um, and I think there was something we were talking about Johnny Carson earlier, you and I weren't, but I was talking about to, to Heidi about Johnny Carson. Mm -hmm. And the thing that always troubled me with Johnny Carson was he was always the star of his show. And, it, and I get it. Johnny Carson's a legend. It was never the show I wanted to have. And the right. show I never, I always wanted the guest to be the star of the show. And, um, and in that way, I always feel like my audience is, is the star of the show because if anybody's going to be acting dumb or anybody's going to have pie on their face, it should be me. 
And the audience is always somebody that I'm going to hold up. And when they say, when they accomplish something, I'm always going to talk about on the show. When they say something, I'm always going to showcase it. Um, and same thing with the guests. Even I don't love all my guests. Some of them are pretty boring, <laughs> but you'll never know it when you listen to my show. You'll never know that I thought their movie stunk. <laughs> like you'll never know it. Um, and that's just kind of the way it is. And it hasn't always, uh, it's just the way it is today. And, and, and I got there too, through some bumps and bruises and trying to be the, the star of my show. And then realizing that I think that was the wrong way to do it. I think you can always help people. And at the end of the day, that led to, um, some successes, like the shirt that we can never keep, uh, from being sold out is the don't hate create shirt. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of been our mantra is like, just support other people. Keep pushing. Doesn't mean we're saints. I'm not a saint. <laughs> so I say some fucked up shit. But uh, <laughs> but it's always in love. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's all, you know, if we're, we're making fun of each other, it's always in love. And um, and so you, you can always help people. That's basically it. You know, always hold people up. And uh, especially your guests. I never it never really sat well with me that that like the host like chair was higher than the guests or they were always like separate than the oh, guests. Right. I thought that was <laughs> like what the fuck? Again, I don't even know if that answered your question. What the hell? <laughs> no, it's all good. You're spouting <laughs> off a lot of extremely useful information. I mean not as useful as I was as a teacher, I'm sure. <laughs> this motherfucker, I ain't learning shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the the focus of the show is really, you know, just learning about creation and giving space for people to really like share the information they've learned over the time that they've been creating and just hearing everyone's different perspectives. But just as we start to wrap this up, you know, what advice would you have for someone that's, I guess, specifically trying to get into what you do in regards to podcasting? Like where do people start? (laughs) It's honestly the biggest, like on a, on a technical level, like, really really engage your friends and family those are the only people who are going to show up for a while mm-hmm. and and until you have a couple little breakthroughs maybe you big guest or this that um you you're gonna have to lean on your friends and family and don't just lean on them to listen lean on them to leave you those reviews lean on them to share the show lean on them to kind of be your outreach and things like reviews and that public image are important because if you start going after bigger guests and they look up and you've got like one review come on, man, you couldn't even get your friends and family to leave your review. Like, right. why would I want to be on your show? So you have to really start building that whole thing. And, and so I definitely, when I solicit bigger guests, let them know that we have like 14,000 people, which is small in a lot of places, but 14,000 yeah. people on Facebook that we got thousands of people here that we have been around since 2006, but we built that small. So start with your friends and family, really get them to be your outreach. I'm your friend, all outreach. You know, the guests on your show up to this point and past this point, they're all going to be your outreach. Lean on them. Really make sure they're they're getting you out there. And then you've heard it a million times. Just show up every week or every two weeks, however long you, however, just be regular. It's the same rules that you had for YouTube. Have that consistent release schedule and make sure you hit it. Uh, You know, um, people want to make sure that when they show up to the watering hole, there's going to be water in it and they know when to go. And if they show up to the watering hole and it's a little bit dry, they might try and go get their water somewhere else. So you really have to keep at it. It's like the oldest business rule in the book that it is twice as expensive to get a customer than to keep a customer. So just make right. sure you keep that customer. And, uh, and and so, again, promote your guests, promote your audience, like be part of their lives, promote it. You know, And that's the greatest thing about podcasting specifically is – that unlike film, unlike TV, unlike video games or all these other mediums, we're intimately re- reacting and very quickly having a response with our audience, you know, yeah. on a personal level. And the level of sincerity in podcasts is beyond even what's in radio, right? Even in radio, there's a little bit of like an elitism to yeah. it. You still feel detached from a radio host, but in podcasting, there's something very personal about it. And, um, I would lean into that. And obviously my rule for anything is if it scares you fucking lean right into it and I mean, just go for it. Worst case scenario is 
you're gonna fuck up you're gonna embarrass yourself you might die and who cares because in like <laughs> years, we're all gonna get sucked into the sun who gives so who gives a shit <laughs> <laughs> i tell myself that all the time i was like well this could really fucking suck but you know what one day you're all gonna get sucked into the sun and nobody's gonna care so it all ends in the heat death of the universe so yeah. you can do that thing oh let's go nobody, nobody <laughs> can remember you embarrass yourself i tell myself that when i'm sitting here putting my chonies on in comic-con be like jonathan you're really gonna run out there in your underwear who gives a shit dude you're about to get stuck <laughs> in a couple of years who gives a damn ain't nobody will remember come on let's go let's go don't be a bitch <laughs> <laughs> Was that useful? <laughs> <laughs> that was just as dumb as it was. I mean, there's definitely that what there's I, something there. It doesn't matter how smart or dumb your audience is, Dakota. As long as I'm dumber than them, they will all know what I'm talking about. That's, that's my key to podcasting. If you're the dumbest person on the podcast, your audience will always know what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> I think just, there's something to learn there. It's my philosophy to life. You ain't too good for me. (laughs) I think that's kind of, you know. Yeah. Yup. Jonathan's killed another conversation. Congrats, pal. (laughs) I really think there's a lot to learn. And there was between all the dumb jokes and everything, you know, I think people could learn a lot from this conversation and from your path over the years. So as we hopefully, yeah, I, I, I sincerely mean that hopefully. As we leave this off, where can people find you and what can they expect from you? Um, I would just say you can find me on Twitter at Jonathan London and you can search for Geekscape on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook or at geekscape.net and you can find us. Um, Obviously, my podcast is called Geekscape. It is on every podcatcher out there, so you can subscribe anywhere. Go ahead, if you like it, leave a review, share it with your friends. But ultimately... um, you know, all my socials are where you're going to find out about the next film or the next project or just the next stupidity. Um, I like <laughs> doing it. So um, I am nothing if not vocal. Uh, so really not so much following, but go ahead and interact with me. I think that's more what I'm interested in. I don't need anybody to follow me, uh, but I love it when people interact with me. That's what I feed off of. Yeah. And I would love for anybody listening to this to interact with me and i'm glad that you were here uh dakota and that you invited me to interact with you man because because even when you were having your singeritis at school and i knew exactly <laughs> what was going on uh i absolutely believed in you and i still believe in you thank you also people should go read your wikipedia page <laughs> <laughs> did you fuck with it no 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 i just i i, Damn. I honestly I think you're it. the doesn't matter. <laughs> I just changed your age, so you're actually like 75. But <laughs> not far off. <laughs> I think you're my. I think you're the only teacher I've had that has a Wikipedia page. Yeah, that came like within the first month of Geekscape. I looked up and I had a a Wikipedia page, and I was like, oh, "All right, so, okay. okay." So then, 2006 Wikipedia was the. <laughs> Yeah, I'm surprised it hasn't gotten deleted. You know what I mean? If somebody's a, like, the, don't they delete those things after a while? Like, oh, this guy ain't shit. <laughs> no, I think it's just like, it's probably just that you've had so much going on that whoever wrote the article kind of gave enough information to where Wikipedia is like, all right, this person's notable. <laughs> I guess you can be part of our free made up history. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, are you not a Wikipedia fan? No, I, I am. We just always have to know what it is, which is right. a, anybody can go and contribute to it. Uh, semi-factual resource. I think I, I do. I, I, if somebody brings something up on Wikipedia and they're like, hey, they said this and it's not true, I will go and like manicure it. Um, but that's it. I think I think that's about all the manicuring I would do. To be like, oh, wait a minute. That shit didn't happen. Um, so I'll glance at it about once a year and make sure that Suddenly, shit isn't weird. I will tell you this, though. You know those, like, online magazines where... Do you know about these things? Like, these online magazines where people can, like, recommend you to be interviewed on this online magazine? Oh, my God. Voyage actually. LA. Yes, Voyage LA. Yes, everyone I know. Like, 
all of my friends from CCH are doing, they're all like, oh. look, I'm in a magazine. I look at it. All you have to do is submit it. I submitted my name. They emailed me with all the questions and I just forgot to respond. I just wanted to like fuck with them and see what they would put in the exactly. article. Exactly. So listen, I'll let, I'll let you in on this one. Um, I've been submitted for Voyage LA multiple times and I've always been like, I'm not into this. <laughs> I can see the value in Voyage LA, especially right. if you're an actor or a personality, because you do want that coverage and you do want links. And it is important as somebody who like is into SEO and is into creating a profile yeah. and a, a bit of a brand, you want those links. And and let's say that you're you know trying to prove to somebody uh, like a tax entity or a coworker or somebody that like you are who you are and this and that. Those things are important. Fine, you want to put it on your website, great. Um, yeah. I was thinking today I should just, because half the stuff on my Wikipedia, you may not believe anyway, like your brother being a pro wrestler. So a part of me was like, I might just lean in and write half fact. And then the other half, like crazy shit (laughs) and just publish it. You know what I mean? And like, when you start asking, you know, when you start thinking about like running around in your underwear and like, having alter egos and characters and like multiple personality disorders like I have and having the crazy little life that I've had up to this point, they might fall for some of the other stuff too. So <laughs> that'll be our secret. So uh, in a free day or so, I think I might just <laughs> fill out that. I might just fill out that application. <laughs> and I see have they to. Cause it's just, yeah. I'm seeing all of my friends being like, look, I'm in a magazine and it's like, ugh. I guess that's just how it works in filmmaking is, is like you submit your uh, press release to a press release company and then you post it on Facebook saying, hey, look, <laughs> it's oh, like, God. shut up. You submitted that yourself. I heard, a Tom, I heard a story about Tom Cruise when he was dating Katie uh, Holmes and they were, it was before they were married, before they had kids and they were just like dating and this and that. And they were, they were walking out of some lunch and some place on Beverly or Beverly Hills, some place, uh, you know, you know, one of the, the, the places where the pro- paparazzi show up and they take all the photos for the magazines. And he came out of there and was like, oh, hey, guys, what are y'all doing here? How'd you find me? And one <laughs> of the guys goes, you called us. <laughs> and that was Tom Cruise, you know. So, yeah, that is the way this thing works. So I think we should work it a little bit Definitely. and play guess the lie <laughs> <laughs> all right all right man yeah. It's been, well, thanks for having me on. yeah definitely we'll have to bring you back on once your uh, article has been published in voyage la <laughs> play guess the lie <laughs> <laughs> yes oh my god we're both going to submit like insane shit insane stuff and then we'll play a game <laughs> so absolutely all right thank you so much everyone you should go and follow jonathan london on literally every social media except site he's TikTok. on <laughs> Old ex- except tiktok because we still haven't convinced him to go on tiktok i don't want the chinese being all that up in my business oh come on it's not real things real and then we get sucked into the sun if there's one thing you learn it should be that <laughs> guys thank you so much for listening i'll see you in the next episode hey everyone it's dakota again thank you so much for listening to this episode with jonathan london of geekscape be sure to go follow him on most platforms at jonathan london also while you're at it be sure to rate unverified leave a review and share it with your friends let me know what you think of the show and tell me who you want to see on the podcast next you can find me on youtube.com slash west dakota twitter at west dakota yt or connect with me on linkedin at dakota Roussard. Thank you. I'll see you next time.